How's that? Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, we are good in the back. Okay, let's get started. So thank you for coming. I'm going to be talking about medical evidence for decision making by health technology assessment programs, such as the work you're all doing. And by way of background, uh, I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm uh, practicing in the US, we do hematology and oncology. We do both. So I did internal medicine and hematology oncology, and I'm actually a professor in epidemiology and biostatistics. And then I always tell people a little bit about myself. My parents, of course, are from India, but I was born in the US and I grew up uh, just outside of Chicago. I did my medical school at the University of Chicago and then internal medicine at Northwestern. Then I spent three years in Washington, DC and did uh, hematology oncology at the National Institutes of Health. Um, and then I was on the faculty in Oregon, which is on our West Coast. And uh, now I've been at UCSF for the past three years. And I do clinic, attend in the hospital. We run a research group and uh, some of what we do you will see today. I also teach some classes. OK, I'll come back to that. So I think the question was that I was asked to try to answer today, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer it, is do we have good evidence for novel therapeutics? And the answer, I think, is no, actually. For many products, we cannot calculate cost effectiveness because we don't really even know that the product is more effective than standard options. And we have some deficiencies in clinical studies that lead to marketing authorization that are so problematic that no amount of correction after the fact can fix it. We can be very conservative and we can say, you know, maybe it doesn't work, but that too is a guess. And the real failure, I think, is an evidence generation failure. And we'll talk about that. So I thought, since this is a broad audience, there's some people who do oncology, there's some people who do hematology, I met one person, and then there are people who do chronic diseases, and there are people who do other things as well. So I thought it would be helpful to do three examples, one from heart failure, one from pancreatic cancer, and one from lung cancer. And those of you who listen to my podcast will probably have heard these examples, because I like these examples, but those of you who haven't, it'll be new to you. Okay, so, let me start with a trial in heart failure where we have issues with the control arm, like what is the control arm getting? Issues with drug dosing and issues with run-in periods. Here's the drug. Secubitril valsartan or Entresto, Novartis drug. And it was the first drug in a long time that came along in heart failure and improved clinical outcomes and improved overall survival. This was the paper that led to US regulatory approval and then later EMA approval and global use which is angiotensin neprilysin inhibition versus enalapril in heart failure. It came out in 2014. Here was the big result. Okay, they took patients with New York Heart 2, 3, and a few 4 heart failure. They randomized you to enalapril, okay, versus a combination drug called LCZ696, which is secubitril and valsartan. Secubitril is the novel drug. It's the inhibitor of neprilysin. Valsartan is a drug we've had for a long time. And the secubitril is the key drug because that's what makes this a patentable compound that's able to have a high price. It's what makes it a branded drug. And as you can see clearly here, this is all cause mortality. It looks pretty significant. The p value has lots of zeros in it, I'm told. And it is clearly the case that the LCZ696 arm is doing better than the enalapril arm. And this is why it's being prescribed globally. I think the sales of this drug have now topped 10 billion per annum, and uh, the US has slated it for, I think, price negotiation. All right, whenever I see a paper like this, I like to, I would say, if you wanna fall asleep, you should read that paper cover to cover. But if you want to understand the paper, you should have questions in your mind and try to find the answer. Questions I have in my mind anytime I read a paper is what was the intervention? What did they do in this study? Is the control arm what you would do outside of the study? I think that's the key question. A clinical trial can only change your practice if the control arm is your practice. If the control arm is not what you're doing, then I think the trial cannot change it. What was the effect size, big or small? Is it a clinical or is it a surrogate endpoint and any games with patient selection? And I think you all have to think about these questions all the time. Okay, so the intervention arm is secubitril valsartan. This is an inhibitor of a novel mechanism of action, neprilysin inhibition, they're pairing it with an angiotensin receptor blocker, 
at 160 milligrams BID, so a very hefty dose of an angiotensin receptor blocker. Why can't they pair this drug with an ACE inhibitor? And the answer is, in a prior study, they had a combination ACE inhibitor and eprilysin inhibitor, but that had a lot of angioedema. And ACE inhibitors have angioedema, and so the thought was, to minimize angioedema, let's pair secubitril with an ARB, which doesn't have that problem, versus instead of an ACE. And the control arm, whenever I ask medical students, what would be the control arm of your study? They always say, it should be Valsartan. You know, we should do a randomized control trial of 10,000 people who are ACE intolerant, or for whatever reason, the doctor is giving them an ARB, and we randomize you to secubitril Valsartan or Valsartan. Nice, clean study, and we learn whether or not the new drug has a benefit over the existing therapy. But that's not the trial they ran. They compared themselves against enalapril, 10 milligrams BID. When this trial was run, I was not giving a lot of enalapril because it's a twice BID drug to dose. And the dose caught my eye because 160 milligrams BID was a hefty dose of Alsartan, but 10 BID didn't feel to me as hefty for enalapril. And in fact, if you looked at the FDA package leaflet, this was the maximal FDA approved dose, and this was the half maximum. So here we have the new drug paired with a maximal dose of an ARB against a half maximal dose of an ACE. And one thing we know in this space is that the dose matters. As you increase the dose, you think you get better outcomes. In fact, that's the mantra in cardiology. They're always up titrating the dose to the most the patient can tolerate, even to the point that the patient is lightheaded. So here's what they did, right? They took 10,000 people, New York Heart 2, 3, 4 heart failure, they randomly assign you to, you know, you stop taking whatever you're taking at baseline. Then you take Entresto, Secubitril, Valsartan, or you take Enalapril, right? This is what they did. Nice, clean study. Except that's not what they did. When you look at the consort diagram, you see something is going on here. It's kind of complicated. Let me make it simple for you. They actually started with 10,000 people with New York Heart 2, 3, 4 heart failure. They told you to stop taking what you're taking at baseline. If you're taking an ACE or an ARB, you stop. And then everybody takes an Alipril, 10 milligrams BID for two weeks. And during that time, 1,000 people drop out of the study. One in 10 people drop out of the study in that time period because the dose of an Alipril is too much, or they are idiosyncratically intolerant to an Alipril, or they die, or they have heart failure exacerbation. All these things happen, and they drop out. And then they give you Secubitril Valsartan, but they don't just give it for 14 days, they give it for 28 days, twice as long. The first 14 days, they do 80 milligrams of Valsartan BID. The second 14 days, they do 160 BID. So they go half max to full max dose. Here, another thousand people drop out of the study. Okay, now they randomize. If you survive these weeks on the study, you get randomized to continue to take the drug you were taking Monday on Tuesday, or the control arm has to switch and go back to an Alipril, which they hadn't taken in a month. All right, so what are the problems with this study? Well, one is the inclusion criteria. They're adding an inclusion criteria to the product that is something you cannot enumerate. You can't put into words what it is because it's you have to survive this double drug run-in period. And we know 20% of people cannot survive it. I mean, they just drop out. The second thing they're doing is the longer you run in on the product, the more you favor that arm. Because the longer you're on the product before you're randomized, you remove people idiosyncratically intolerant to that product in week three or four from one arm, but not people idiosyncratically intolerant to the product in week three or four from the other arm. So the Secubitril Valsartan has a benefit by having a longer run in. And then finally, if all these drugs are equivalent and there's a penalty for switching products, Every time you switch, 1% of people have exacerbation just because you need to get a new drug on board. Only the control arm pays that penalty, not the experimental arm. So this trial is extremely problematic in my sense. Okay, you got max dose ARB with your new drug against half dose enalapril, double drug run in period, unequal periods of time. Your drug gets to go last. Okay, and then my question was, well, what percent of people took a higher dose of enalapril at baseline? Because if you max the dose out at 10 milligrams BID in your study, but the FDA drug leaflet says you can give 20 BID, there's gotta be somebody out there who is taking 15 milligrams BID. They enrolled on your study. 
they were doing fine on 15 milligrams BID at home. They enroll on your study, and all you do is you assign them to control arm, and then you lower their dose of, in of enalapril. In other words, what percent of people in this study could you have pushed the dose of these drugs higher, especially the ACE inhibitor arm? How are you going to find that out? Turns out in the supplement, they actually give you a clue. This is the angiotensin receptor blocker doses and ACE inhibitor doses at, at the screening visit. They tell you the mean 16.4 milligrams and the standard deviation 8.3. So with the mean dose and the standard deviation dose, I can calculate how many people took more than 20 a day using a normal distribution. Okay, assuming the drug is being normally distributed. And the answer is about one in three. One in three people enrolled on this study was already taking a higher dose of ACE inhibition than the control arm permitted them to take. So the control arm is just reducing their dose, which is something that cardiologists would say is the bad thing to do, is unethical to do. It's actually gonna worsen their outcomes. These are not the average person with heart failure. These are people in whom you could have pushed the dose, okay? But that's not quite right because this drug is not given like an IV medicine. It's given in pill sizes. And a few years ago, this gentleman watched my talk and he said, actually, let me help you with that equation. He says, let's imagine it only comes in certain pill sizes. How do you get that same mean and standard deviation? And obviously this was the equation that one would use, which, you know, I knew that, but I didn't want to show off. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. And then what he finds is that it's about, you know, 15% of people were getting a higher dose at baseline than the max prescribed dose. This is just one solution. You know, the, the, the trialists have the answer to the question. And the other thing I'd say is that before you enrolled on the study, nobody was incentivized to increase the dose, whereas they were in the study. So of this 15%, some of these people probably could have taken this dose if you tried it. Nobody's been trying that dose. But I think it points to the core fact, okay, that this trial now has several problems. One, max dose ARB against half dose ACE. There were people who were already taking a higher dose at baseline, ergo they could have taken more. Double drug run-in period, unequal periods of time. Your drug gets to go last. Your drug uh, has uh, uh, twice as long to dose escalate. Uh, everything is favoring the intervention arm. I asked Rosa Ahn, who was a student who worked with me, I said, pull every cardiology drug approval in the last decade in cardiology. And that's 141 studies. And I asked, how many studies for drug approval are like this study, where it's drug A plus B versus C? Secubitril plus Valsartan versus Enalapril. It's a very unusual study because we get a lot of drug A versus B, Valsartan versus Enalapril, drug, you know, uh, Empagliflozin versus placebo we get, drug AB versus A versus B. Yeah, that makes sense because you can see the, the synergy of the two drugs. But A plus B versus C, the answer was only two studies. This was one. And the other was isosorbide, hydralazine, which is a drug called Bidil that was tested against enalapril. But for that product, the FDA required a confirmatory study of isosorbide, hydralazine against placebo, and then they never did that for this product. So one point I wanna make is that this is a very unusual design. It's the only trial in the last 20 years of drug approval that's had this design, A plus B versus C. The next thing is some trials had run-in periods, some trials didn't, but there was no trial that had a double drug run-in period of unequal periods of time. All right. So let me say, we wrote in circulation, we said, uh, this, this needs a confirmatory study. Um, the PI of the study said, our trial, Paradigm HF, is so large, the p-value has so many zeros in it, it's like four studies, it's like running four studies. I said, that's not like running four studies. I mean, p-value with a lot of zeros just tells you that were you to sample the same distribution twice, you would never get this result. I mean, this is an extremely unlikely result, assuming the null hypothesis. But it doesn't tell you that the LCZ696 arm did better because it's a better drug. It might have done better because it's a better drug, but it might have done better because the backbone medicine was twice as high, because you had a double drug run-in period that favored your product, because your product was the one you got to continue taking at randomization, and the control arm had to discontinue. All those reasons might be my, your arm did better, not because Secubitril adds anything. So we need a confirmatory study of secubitril valsartan versus valsartan in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we wrote this up in circulation. They done a few more studies. They did Paragon, which looked at heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's a negative study. 
for Secubitril Valsartan. They did Paradise MI, which is post-myocardial infarction, and that's also a negative study for Secubitril Valsartan. It's one of the few drugs that works in reduced ejection fraction, so we're told, but it doesn't work after a heart attack, which is weird. My conclusion? Yes. All right, we're back. Technical difficulties resolved. All right, where were we talking about? Uh, where are we again? No, I forgot everything. Okay, um, so we're talking about the Paradigm HF trial. It's a blockbuster drug. You know, one study led to regulatory approval. So many problems. You know, inappropriate dosing of the medicines, inappropriate dosing of the comparator. You can prove that these patients could have taken a higher dose of enalapril. For some reason, it's artificially being capped by the sponsor. Double drug run-in period, unequal periods of time. Your drug gets the benefit of not switching at randomization. So many problems. We don't even know who it applies to. There's actually even more problems. We use the drug in clinical practice at doses lower than the dose that was tested in the trial. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen anybody actually getting the trial dose. But the dose did, the trial did not test any other dose than the maximal dose. You couldn't be in the study unless you couldn't tolerate the maximal dose. So the dose we're giving you, um, oh, well, I'll come back to that. The next thing, it's an unfair comparator. The control arm could have had their dose escalated at least in 15%. Why? Because they were already taking a higher dose, but probably more because if you actually put a concerted effort to increase the dose, you might get it as high as 25, 30% of people on a higher dose. You know, the double drug run-in period, I think it's problematic. So in my opinion, Entresto is probably no better than just trying to increase the ACE inhibitor. Who is going to study this? A single randomized study globally where you take actual providers in practice and you say, we'll randomize you to switch to Entresto or just make an effort to try to increase the ACE or ARB dose, primary endpoint all-cause mortality, would settle this once and for all. And the savings will be tens of billions of dollars globally per year, maybe life cycle, $100 billion. But yet there's no entity globally that's going to run this trial. And the company is happy not to run the trial. In fact, they don't want you to. They've already captured the US market share. It took them a while, but through drug dinners and catering to sponsors and catering to the KOLs, they have gotten everyone to prescribe their drug. People think it's a better drug. I have no evidence it's a better drug. The last thing I'd say is when it comes to the flozins, empagliflozin, depagliflozin, there's so many different flozins in heart failure. And so that to me gives credibility to the idea there's something about that class of medicine. But with secubitril valsartan, there's only one bitril. There's no drug made by any other company that has entered this space that is an eprilysin inhibitor. So it's a very unique product. I think it's probably not any better than just trying to increase the ACE. So that's a big multi-million dollar study, New England Journal paper, so much fanfare, thousands and thousands of citations, and I think just absolutely useless for regulatory decision making. I would reject the study outright. I don't, I, can't, I don't know if the drug adds anything. It could even be harmful, actually. Secubitril could be a harmful agent, worse than trying to increase the ACE inhibitor. We don't know. And yet it's widely used to change guidelines. All our economic analyses have to be predicated on the fact that there, it is better. But is it better? I don't know. Okay, let's talk about pancreas cancer. <clears throat> a few years later, I read this paper. It was called Maintenance Olaparib for Germline. I know the people who listened to my talks before, they're going to say, I've heard this like a thousand times. Um, by show of hands, who here has heard me talk about the polo trial? Two? Okay, not too many. All right, good. So it'll be new to most of you. All right. I was reading the New England Journal of Medicine. I saw this paper, maintenance olaparib, AstraZeneca drug, for BRCA mutated metastatic pancreas cancer, but germline. What does that mean? Oh my God. Well, we all know that each year, you know, some people develop pancreas cancer that results in their death, unfortunately. In the US, it's I think 40,000 people a year, but in your country, it must be maybe 1,000 or something just based on population size. Um, of the people who get pancreas cancer, some people have a germline mutation in the BRCA gene, means they're born with it, like Angelina Jolie, and they're predisposed to getting pancreas cancer, among other cancers. And if you have a BRCA mutation, either germline you were born with, or somatic you acquired in your life, we think this olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, is a very good drug for such a person 
because of the mechanism of action which prevents DNA repair in a certain way that is preferentially used in people with BRCA deficiency, double strand DNA repair. Okay, put another way. If you have pancreas cancer, 15% of people have this BRCA mutation when they were born, maybe, and those people, the company thinks this drug is gonna work really well in because of how it works molecularly. That's the gist of it. So that's why they're doing this study. And when I saw this study come out, I opened my inbox and I see things like this. Okay, all the news outlets in drug development are covering this discovery. They say the dynamic duo wants to dominate the market for cancer drugs. And here's what the vice president of the company says. It's unbelievable. It validates the principle that we have been fighting for all these years, that even the most difficult disease, even the disease where you think you're not going to win, if you find the genetic vulnerability, if you find that, then those giants, they crumble. And then I said, wow, it's got to be good. <laughs> wow, it's going to be good. I mean, look at that. He's really selling it. He's selling the hell out of it. Okay, so what is this? Well, before I looked at the paper, I saw one more quote. Oh, that's the picture of uh, myself and the guy who said it, Jose Baselga, a few years ago. All right. Then I looked at the press release, the University of Chicago, my alma mater is where I went to med school. And this is what the PI says. When we saw the progression-free survival data, my first reaction was a little scream of joy. We finally made real progress in the treatment of a subset of patients with advanced pancreas cancer. So she's screaming for joy when she sees these results. I say, okay, this has got to be good. Let's take a look. So again, whenever I read the article, I always have my questions. What do they do? Is the control arm what you would do in your practice? What about primary secondary endpoints? All right, let's get into this. This is my oncology appraisal. So what did they do? They took these patients with germline, they're born with the mutation in BRCA and they happen to have pancreas cancer. And they give them the standard of care practice, which is platinum-based chemotherapy for four months, 16 weeks, four months, they get the standard of care therapy. And if your tumor does not get bigger, if it didn't grow by 20% or more, you were randomized three to two. It's got skewed randomization, I think, to make it more enticing. We have a paper where we prove that you can skew the randomization, but actually you don't increase the enrollment rate. There's no correlation between skewed randomization and enrollment per month. It does not actually make it more enticing to patients. Done for other reasons, which we can think about. Okay, to Olaparib, $12,000 a month, at least in the US medicine, maybe you get it for a discount, maybe $4,000 a month, but I doubt you get it any cheaper than that. Or sugar pill, placebo, twice daily. Okay, is the control arm what you would do in your practice? Hmm, when this study came out, did I take patients with pancreatic cancer and I gave them four months of therapy and if their tumor wasn't any bigger, I said, you know what, stop all therapy and just take this sugar pill. Just go take that sugar pill. The answer is I would never do that. That's horrifically unethical. You're supposed to continue to give chemotherapy until they progress. That's how we have always practiced. You would give all those drugs for until you have progression. You don't stop it and put somebody on observation. That's never been a standard of care in pancreas cancer. Nobody was doing that. I bet not a single one of the trialists on this study did that outside of the trial. Okay, that's one. Two, if you really wanted to make the case for stopping something, I think many of us would give six months of all of the drugs and then stop the platinum, but continue the 5-FU. There's some other sort of complicated, but if the patient's not tolerating it well, but if the patient's doing fine, you're just gonna keep giving all the drugs. So my first problem with the study, the control arm is not what I would do. In fact, I think it's deficient. You're withdrawing a proven drug. You're, you're, you're giving somebody less than standard of care on the control arm. I think that's a problem. Now, the, the company said, well, look, they got four months of the platinum-based drugs. Okay, that's pretty good, actually. If you look at the original study where we developed the platinum-based chemotherapy, they only got five months of it. We give them four, you know, it's practically the same thing. They say it's pretty close. And the study they're talking about is this study from the French group, Fulfirinox versus gemcitabine in pancreas cancer. This is that platinum-based therapy that they're talking about, Fulfirinox, 5-FU, 5-FU leucovore and irinotecan and oxaliplatin, okay? But it's got the platinum in it, oxaliplatin, okay? And it says in the paper, the median number of cycles administered was 10, in the platinum group and each cycle is two weeks. So 10 cycles, two weeks is five months. 
and we gave four months. Pretty close, right? Pretty close. Well, I have a problem with pretty close because the first problem is this study enrolled everybody from the day they had pancreas cancer. Your study only enrolls people who have not had the cancer get bigger after four months of therapy. In this study, as you can see, how many people's cancer gets bigger in the first four months? The answer is a third of them. A third of people in the original study would not have been eligible for polo because their tumor has progressed in the first four months. So what is so? And then the five month average treatment is everybody in this group. But what you really want to know is the average treatment in everyone here. These are the people who ostensibly could be in the polo study, you know, not the average here, the average just in this subgroup of people who didn't progress in four months. And the answer is it should be it's seven months, seven months treatment median on average in people who didn't progress in the first four months. So now you're you're giving them about half as much as they'd get, right? You're shortchanging them about half as much as they would get. Actually, that's not the full story. Because in polo, you're not taking everybody with pancreas cancer. You're just taking germline BRCA mutant patients who are younger than the average age, often fitter than the average patient, and they can often get even more therapy. And I won't bore you with how I did it, but I calculated that they should be getting about 12 months or more of platinum-based therapy. And they would have been had they not been on the polo study where somebody randomized them to sugar pill. They would have gotten 12 months of chemotherapy. So now the control arm is looking very bad in my mind. You are depriving these patients of eight months, two thirds of proven therapy to put them on sugar pill just so you could test your new drug. All right, so I have some problems with this already. I'm getting a little nervous. I'm gonna let out a scream, but it's not gonna be of joy. So whenever I read the article, I look at what's the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival a time to event composite endpoint, which I think many of you have to deal with. It's the time until one of four things happen. I'm gonna show you what that is, but these are the results. This is the curve that she got so excited about. You can see there's a difference here. And the median PFS on sugar pill is four months and it's seven months on the treatment. But one sad thing to note is that the curves eventually touch the x-axis, meaning that nobody is cured by this drug. Best case scenario, it delays the time until the tumor gets bigger, but nobody is being cured by this medicine. Is it a clinical endpoint or surrogate endpoint? Is it a direct measure of what matters to patients or is it a stand-in for that? Is it like your LDL cholesterol or your A1C? And I think it's a surrogate endpoint and here's why. Well, what is it? What we do is we measure your tumor on the scan initially and it's the time until, one, and it has a diameter, a cross-sectional area and a volume. And it's the time until one of four things happen. Number one, the patient could die. That's the survival part of it. Number two, there could be new lesions on the scan. The lungs had nothing. Now the lungs have new lesions. That's a progression event. The tumor could get bigger, but how much bigger? It has to get 120% bigger. 119%, that's called stable disease. 121 is called progression. But of course, nobody's walking around saying, I'm 118%, I feel good, 119, I feel good, 121%, oh, I feel terrible. You know, it's arbitrary. They've picked these arbitrary cutoffs for what they can measure, not what really matters to people. That's progression. The third thing that could happen is the tumor shrinks. If it shrinks more than 30%, we call that a response. You have a response, a partial response, if you shrink more than 30%. And if you shrink, then they measure progression from the smallest it ever gets from the nadir value. So 84% diameter here is called progression because it shrank down to 70%. Okay, so progression-free survival is the time until one of four things happens, which, whichever comes first. Um, studies do not often break out. Like in cardiology, we have the major adverse cardiovascular events, and then they tell you how many of each there are. In progression-free survival, they never tell you how many of one events one, two, three, and four are there. We have a paper coming in Nature Views Clinical Oncology, which is gonna be the history and overview of all the composite endpoints in oncology, all these time to event endpoints like DFS, EFS, and we're gonna talk more about that in that paper. Okay, so because those tumor dimensions, like 70%, you, it's not like you feel bad at 71% and good at 69%. These are arbitrary thresholds that are picked. And for that reason, it's a surrogate endpoint. All right, so what about other measures, activity or efficacy? So I told you that if your tumor shrinks 
30% or more, you are a responder. Okay, 30% shrinkage, you're a responder. If you took Olaparib in this study, 20% of people had a response. They had their cancer shrink. But if you took sugar pill in this study, 10% of people had the cancer shrink. 10%. I'm no expert on cancers and sugar pills, but I don't think they shrink cancers. Not in one in 10 people, that's a lot. And in fact, I'll prove it to you, it's a lot in a second. It's a very high, you know, everybody's worried about sugar and cancer, but nobody says it's shrinking the cancer. I never heard anyone say it's shrinking the cancer. Okay, what about overall survival? You know, what European regulators care about, but they don't care about at FDA. Overall survival is a total wash. There's absolutely no difference in overall survival in this study. And in fact, even in the original paper, they know the median is 18 months in both arms. Why do they even use progression-free survival if you can directly measure overall survival? You don't need to use a surrogate. You've already collected the, the hard endpoint. You've already collected the clinical endpoint. You didn't even need this. You can delete that. Just pro present this. There's no difference in survival. And yet they're hanging their hat on the PFS. So how do I put these facts together? You have an improvement in the time until the tumor gets 20% bigger. Sugar pill has a very high rate of tumor shrinkage. Very, very high. Is that typical? 10% sugar pill shrinks tumors 10% of the time. Is that typical? Well, Ian Tanock from Princess Margaret looked at the sugar pill arms of all the studies back in the day. This is like 30 year old paper. And he said that tumor response shrinking 30% measured by WHO, which is actually comparable to current criteria, was observed in 2% of patients, 2.7. Now it's not zero because measuring a tumor on a CAT scan is like measuring the width of a cloud. You know, it's a little bit arbitrary. And so there's gonna be some measurement error, but it's not 10%. You do not see 10% tumor shrinkage from sugar pills. You might see 2%, this is measurement error. Okay, does anyone know why? in this study, the sugar pill has so much tumor shrinkage. Here's the hint, here's what they did to enroll on poll. Oh yes, go ahead. Yes, he says that the chemo still has some effect. So what they did here was they had you take the chemo for four months. Your tumor could not have gotten bigger, but it could have started to shrink a little bit. And then if you get a sign, you get stop the chemo and get take the Olaparib and 20% of people have the tumor shrink from here to here, 20% shrink from here to here. Maybe 10% of that is attributable to the Olaparib because the other 10% is attributable to sugar pill. 10% of people have the tumor shrink from here to here. And what he's saying is the only explanation for that is not that the sugar pill is doing anything, but they're still getting shrinkage from the prior chemotherapy. That's chemotherapy that I've already told you I would have continued to give. You're not supposed to stop. They should be getting a year of it and that they're still driving benefit. Imagine how much more benefit they would have had if you were just allowed to keep taking it. Instead of being put on sugar pill, you just keep getting chemo. This wouldn't be a 10% response rate. I don't even think it would be 20. I bet it would be 30 or 40% response rate. So in other words, this trial cannot improve overall survival when you basically provide unethical treatment to the control arm, withdraw chemotherapy, chemotherapy that they're responding to, proof that they're responding to is they're still responding even though you haven't given it in so long. If you had just kept giving the chemotherapy, Olaparib wouldn't just be a drug that doesn't improve survival, it will be a drug that shortens life because it's probably better to continue to take the chemotherapy. You see, it's not just a drug that's null, it's a drug that's probably de detrimental. If you have it in health systems, it will lead people to make the bad choice, stopping chemo and putting you on this drug rather than just giving you more chemo. So Polo, you halt a drug normally not halted. You randomize people to a new costly toxic pill. I mean, it's $12,000 a month and it has real side effects. Or placebo, you measure an endpoint that is not a measure of what matters. Historically has never been accepted in oncology in pancreas cancer. I mean, we, did, we never used PFS before Polo because we had to just measure survival as I showed you. You don't improve survival. Health related quality of life is actually not better so what does the US FDA do? On the question of whether Olaparib has a favorable risk benefit profile, the ODAC votes narrowly in favor, seven to five. And they say the answer is heck yeah, heck yeah. 
It says pancreas cancer's risk is ultimate. When I see this, I don't think scream of joy. I don't think the giants are crumbling. I don't think heck yeah. I think this is an unethical study that should never have been run where the control arm was getting a substandard treatment, which is nothing, which you would never have given to your mother or father. None of the investigators were ever doing this outside the study, I'm sure. The control arm is still responding to drugs you're not allowing them to take. So you're just watching them die while you withhold those drugs from them that their tumors were shrinking to. Proof of that is they're responding on sugar pill to drugs they haven't seen. You still don't get a survival benefit. You would have gotten a survival de detriment if you had allowed them proper therapy and it cost $12,000 a month. It's not just, it's not just not good. It's so problematic. I mean, I think it's, it, it cuts to everybody involved in this is, is, uh, is, is guilty of something pretty bad here. So when people say, should polo change clinical practice? We wrote in the journal cancer. No, I mean, it's just absolutely terrible study. Shouldn't have even been allowed to be run. And the FDA using this to approve a product makes no sense at all. I mean, what are they doing at FDA? Okay, so now you are the regular, now you have to try to figure out the cost effectiveness of this product. I mean, this is the study design we're left with. And there's no other study. No one's ever gonna run another study on this product forever. So this is what we're left with, this is the evidence. But meanwhile, if you ask most pancreas cancer doctors, they will come up to this podium and they say, well, listen, there's lots of patients I see and I give them chemo and they don't want, they want a chemo break. Chemo is so bad, chemo is so bad. This is a non-chemo drug. Well, is it side effects like, not like chemo? Well, it's similar, it's a, a very comparable side effects, but it's a not chemo drug, it's a pill. Who wouldn't want to switch to the pill? And so you can easily get like everybody to prescribe it even though the evidence is so bad. Okay, third example, lung cancer. So in cancer medicine, we have this feature that's often in our studies called crossover where you randomize cancer patients to a new drug or placebo. And when they have that progression event, that 20% growth, they get to take the new drug. Well, it creates some problems because now everybody's on the new drug. So it could be confounding variable. And then if you get everyone on the new drug, how do you figure out what would have happened to overall survival had they stayed on placebo? Create some problems. Meanwhile, there are also studies where they don't have crossover but sometimes the doctor says maybe they should have. Okay, so it's kind of, okay, another way to put it. If you get assigned to the drug and you have progression, you get a standard of care. And if you get assigned to placebo and you have progression, you get the drug. And only then thereafter you get standard of care. It's another way to look at it. So I think the reason we get confused about crossover is that there's two broad categories in oncology. There's studies where it is desirable and you want to have crossover. And there's studies where it's undesirable you do not want to have it. No, don't put it in there. It's crazy to do it. And there are studies where they have it and where they don't have it. And so if you want to have it and you get it, that's good. And if you don't want to have it, you don't get it, that's good. So these are the ones where you're getting what you want, but these are the ones where you don't get what you want. Those are bad. And we actually have many, many oncology studies that fit in these two red buckets. They're bad. And we have many studies that we have difficulty interpreting because we forget, do we want it or not? So let me give you my framework. I'll give you one example in each category. I guess I go for about another, go for 15, 20 minutes because of the technical difficulties. Okay. Sipilucil T. So maybe about 10 years ago, I like this example because it really makes the point. Some of my examples, I really make the point. Okay, 10 years ago, they made a cancer immunotherapy vaccine. You take somebody with prostate cancer, you collect some of their cells, you make a vaccine against the prostate antigen, and you inject them with that so their own body will fight off their own prostate cancer. That's the idea of how it works. And they do this Cipilucil T immunotherapy. It costs $90,000, made by Provenge Pharmaceuticals, for castrate-resistant prostate cancer. You don't need to know much about that other than it's prostate cancer. They're giving you a vaccine to slow the growth of the tumor, help you live longer. And the primary endpoint is overall survival. What are we complaining about? This is overall survival. And in the control arm, you see, they do poorly. And in the Cipilucil T arm, they do better. It's a four month difference in OS from 20 some to 24 months. Statistically significant all cause mortality benefit. You know, you know what's to argue with here? Looks pretty good. But it had a few problems. It's the only vaccine ever to be approved in history. We've been studying this for 40 years. And just like there's only one Bitril, and there's so many flozins, there's only one vaccine. 
You've tried 100 vaccines. They've all failed. This is the one winner. It's amazing. How did it win? Everything else has not worked, but this one works. Okay, good. It had no responses. Not a single person had the tumor shrink 30%. Zero people had the tumor shrink. In fact, it didn't shrink tumor at all. It also didn't even slow the time until the tumor got bigger. It didn't change the progression-free survival either. So it doesn't shrink the cancer. It doesn't slow it from growing, but it improves survival. How does it do that? It's kind of crazy. It still has the four-month benefit. So what happened in this study was they took the patients with prostate cancer, they randomized them to the vaccine or placebo, but when they progressed, they had crossover. So if you got placebo, what did you get? Got the vaccine. And if you got the vaccine, what did you get? You got docetaxel. And docetaxel is a very interesting drug because it's been proven to improve survival in prostate cancer. And in the control arm, you only got docetaxel if you progressed a second time. So now we have a randomized study with two moving parts. It's a randomized study of cipolucil T versus placebo, but also early docetaxel versus delayed docetaxel, okay? And the authors want you to believe that the cipolucil T improved the survival when the reality might be that the delay in docetaxel is harming the control group. In fact, it says in the study, how many people get the crossover, blah, blah, blah. And basically what it says is that if you got cipolucil T, 57% of people got docetaxel, only 50% of people in the other arm got, ever got docetaxel. And they got it after 12 months here on average, here 14 months. Okay. So now you have a drug that doesn't, first of all, nothing ever of this class of medicine has ever been approved. It's the only one ever to be approved. So that's low pretest probability. Two, it doesn't shrink cancer. It has no activity. It doesn't slow tumor growth, no activity. It has an imbalance in a subsequent therapy, docetaxel, that has been proven to be life-saving over and over again. At least five or six randomized studies show survival benefits. So which is it? This is what the American AHRQ writes in a report. We cannot exclude the fact that survival benefit in the absence of shrinkage or growth is actually due to harm towards the control group from a delay in chemotherapy due to getting an ineffective frozen salvage product. So they're actually pretty much say this could be worthless. So why was crossover undesirable in this study? You actually didn't want crossover because you never want crossover in a trial assessing the fundamental efficacy of a product. If it's the first study to look at the efficacy of the product, you do not want crossover because of course the companies will say there would have been a survival benefit were it not for crossover, but you can't exclude the fact that there would have been a survival reduction or no survival benefit without the crossover. The crossover could be muddying the water for all downstream therapies. We see this over and over again. So actually, it's, ba it's bad. It had crossover, but it wasn't supposed to. Cipolucil T is right in here. Let me give you another example, more recent. This is the Adora study. This is the study that establishes adjuvant osimertinib as the new standard of care for lung cancer. This is people with lung cancer. We cut out the lung cancer entirely and we randomize you to osimertinib or placebo and we follow you for relapse. And this relapse is shown here. Osimertinib is doing so well. Placebo is doing so poorly. You know, big difference. It's $17,000 a month in the US. Actually, now I think it's like 20,000. This is an old slide. And in this country, it still must be 4,000, 5,000 a month. I bet AstraZeneca is not giving any deals on this. Oh, this is a talk full of AstraZeneca drugs. Okay, so if I were designing this study, you know, working at a, uh, working at an impartial manner, I would say we should take people with non-small cell lung cancer with that mutation that benefits from the drug and stage them with PET-CT and MRI brain. And then we should go forward. Now, why do I want to stage them with PET-CT and MRI brain? In the trial, they didn't mandate these things and they didn't always do them. But if you don't do a PET-CT and you don't do an MRI, you're going to get some people who already have brain mets or metastatic disease enrolled in your study. You think they're localized cancer, but they're not. You would have found that out had you done these scans, okay? Now, why does the company you know, want, want those patients on the study? And the answer is they've already proven that osimertinib is a drug that improves PFS and OS for people with metastatic disease. So if you don't look for metastatic disease, you'll have some of the people in whom you already know it's a winner. 
it's already a winner in those people. So they don't do the proper staging and they may enrich with what we call occult metastatic disease. Like you don't know it's there, but it's there, but that favors their arm. The next thing, they should all complete adjuvant chemotherapy, which is the standard of care at the time. They should all get the chemotherapy, but in this study, they have very, very low rates of chemotherapy. Now, why does the company like that? Because the lower the adjuvant chemotherapy, the higher the event rate, and the easier it is for you to see a benefit for your product. So they have no incentive to get people to get the proper standard treatment. They just want to test their product. In fact, they have every incentive to try to talk you out of getting it. They could say something like, you know, our study's enrolling right now and we have a spot, but if you get that adjuvant chemo, I don't know if the spot's going to be available, which is probably how they put it, is my guess. In fact, I've heard similar things over the years. Okay, then you get randomized to osimertinib after the surgery. And when your cancer relapses in this arm, you got to get old fashioned chemotherapy because you've exhausted your targeted options versus once your cancer relapses in this arm, you get observation, you get osimertinib at relapse. Why? Because this is already the standard of care. This is my design. This trial should have crossover. Why should it have crossover? Because osimertinib is already proven to be the best drug when you have metastatic disease. It's already proven benefit here. This is the control arm. This is what I'm doing in my clinic before you ran your study. And this is your experimental strategy. Okay, so the key question in this trial is how many people got osimertinib at relapse among those who could? The answer should be 100%. Should be 100%. If it's anything less than 100%, it's a trial of osimertinib early versus osimertinib never. And that's not a question that anyone's facing, okay? Should be 100%. What was the answer when they finally report the results years later? 38%. 38% of those who recurred, this is Roy Herbst, got osimertinib. Now, I think this is just as, in fact, it's, 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 well, it's hard to argue, which is more unethical. This is unethical. You're running your trial and you're trying to give your new drug to lots and lots of people. In order to get a win, you're doing a lot of design features that will favor your drug. One, you're not doing CT, PET scan, and MRI brain. They say it's because the, the places, they can't afford it. You can't afford a PET scan but you can't afford a PET scan, but you can afford $700,000 of osimertinib. Is that what you're telling me? You know, your intervention drug is so expensive. If you can afford the drug, you should be able to get the PET scan. MRI brain, you have occult brain disease in the study. That'll favor your drug. And the control arm, when they have progression, they're not allowed to get the drug if effectively because it's run in place where they don't have it. So everything about this trial, it's not even, it's not even a scientific study. It's really sort of a seeding study. It's a study meant to gain the FDA's approval and meant to gain market share, but scientifically and ethically, it has no validity. It doesn't help any doctor or any patient. So, okay, the other thing to note here is that as you go down in lines of therapy, the available patient population gets smaller. So this is an assumption that many more people have adjuvant than relapse and some people will die before a second line. So the company's incentive is to move it up so they get a much bigger market share and have more revenue per year. I mean, that's the gist of it. Okay, so, you know, they have all these KOLs, the, the real, the experts, and this is one of the things the experts said on Twitter, which shocked me. He says, you know, you all complain about the price, but let's be honest, you got to take this one way or the other. You can take it early or you take it later. He says, all those who relapse must pay for osimertinib or even more with inflation. And so it's a faulty argument. You're only paying for people who would have been cured. And by year three, that's very few. And then I said, that doesn't make any sense at all because they take three years of this drug. And I said, okay, look, I ran the rough numbers using the median duration of treatment. If you assume 100%, if you assume 100% uh, of people take it, you're basically talking of like $60 million. And it's uh, assuming that, you know, it's a $40 million premium. Let me put it another way. It's $450,000 per person extra to give it early than give it late. You know, this argument that you're going to get it anyway, is not a good argument. It's just crazy talk. They stop making it. Okay, so what's the point here? Many, many of these industry studies are asking if their drug that they know works later in disease works better early. They have an obligation in the control arm to give the drug later because that's what they've already established. They never want to give the drug later. They always want to run it in global places where they don't have access to the drug. They prove that giving it early is better than essentially never giving it, but that's not the question that faces the US or Denmark or Germany or any other country. It's a question that's unique to the trial. 
We looked at all of the nivolumab and pembrolizumab studies. Somebody told me that pembrolizumab last year, the earnings is $59 billion, one year earnings. It's crazy. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. 20 years ago, paclitaxel broke $1 billion in one year, and people thought that was huge. Now, $60 billion one year. Unbelievable. On Friday, I give a talk, and I, I'll talk about how it's cheaper from a regulatory standpoint instead to just give everybody six doses of pembrolizumab than it is to do it the way we're doing it now. Just give every cancer patient six doses. It's cheaper, a lot cheaper, and you actually probably get a very comparable result than giving some people, you know, seven years of therapy. Okay. In all of the studies that try to move the checkpoint inhibitor from the last line to the front line, these are the graphs. This is the, the gray bar shows you people who don't get, don't get the checkpoint inhibitor in the control arm when they progress. The gray, the dark gray, and the light gray. And basically, it's the majority of patients. This is a paper we did with Ashray Maniar in the European Journal of Cancer. But basically, we're proving that every time the company moves it forward, they're not giving it to the control arm on the back end. And that's how they're just, that's how the, you know, the 60 billion, a lot of that's come from routine upfront use. All right, now some closing thoughts. Okay, so we did one cardiology example. We did, all right, the cardiology example, the problems with the cardiology example were, the endpoint was good. Overall survival was good but the control arm was no good. It was a submaximal dose of an ACE inhibitor. It was a BID ACE inhibitor, which is also kind of harder to take than a once daily drug. Um, the drug dosing was bad. Um, sorry, I'll just say that beyond the problems we've discussed, we have bad endpoints, bad control arms, bad post-protocol therapy, bad drug dosing, bad dose reductions. In the first example, we had double drug run-in periods. We had a bad control arm dose. I proved to you they probably were taking a higher dose. In the second example, you were giving them chemotherapy, the tumor was shrinking, and then you stopped it and put them on sugar pill just so you could have a drug that didn't improve survival and didn't improve quality of life. That's a bad study. In the third example, Adora, you're randomizing hundreds of people to take this drug, and then the few people who relapse who should be getting it, you don't give it to them. You only give it to one in three of them, and then they have really bad outcomes, and then you celebrate that everyone should get this new drug. These are all trials where there's no way to salvage it from a, a clinical trial interpretation standpoint. What would have been the hazard ratio in paradigm had they done it right? I don't know. One, 1.05, 1.2, or is it still 0.9? I don't know. I don't know the answer. We can't figure that out. What would have been the hazard ratio for Olaparib if they competed against chemotherapy? My guess is like 1.4. It's hazardous, you know? What would have been Adora overall survival had they gone against a, a fair comparator of a, of a Samaritan relapse? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't work at all. We looked at all of the studies in oncology a few years ago, and we found out that 67% of the cancer trials that lead to FDA approval, you can find one or more limitation like this, like the ones I've shown you. It's not just some of the studies, it's nearly all of the studies. They all have these problems, mostly because the US regulator has allowed them to have these problems and they still keep approving. If the US regulator said no, they wouldn't have the problems. Okay, wait, no, that's the wrong button. Okay, so what does this mean for us? I think it means that we often have no data to guide us. We spend so much time looking at these studies, but it's really like no better than no data. If you have a patient with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, I have no idea if Entresto is better. So it leads to struggles with patients and struggles with payers. For Entresto, what do I tell my patients? If you have heart failure, should you take Entresto? Should you switch? I don't know. I would say probably just increase your ACE inhibitor. No one has proven to me that that's any worse than switching to Entresto and you're gonna save so much money. And yet in America, every hospital I work at, they're trying to move people to Entresto even when they're doing fine. Okay, they're doing the opposite. Olaparib, I say, hell no. I don't say heck yeah, I say hell no. Just keep taking chemotherapy. I wouldn't give anyone Olaparib in pancreas cancer. I think it's unethical. I would give more chemotherapy and maybe I'll stop the oxaliplatin if they have neuropathy and give 5-FU, which is very well tolerated. For Adora, my, with a patient, what I would tell them is, I don't know, maybe take it, maybe not, depends on how it goes. Maybe the answer for the individual patient is just try it. If you don't have any side effects, then, you know, if somebody else is going to pay for it, so be it. But if you're stage three, no side effects. But if you have side effects, maybe it's not worth it to take. I don't know. But it's very difficult as a doctor to have these conversations. It's very difficult as a doctor to go in a room and have a conversation when you have no evidence to guide you. I mean, you might as well ask me, how do you counsel your patients about, uh, uh, you know, 
about some vitamin and supplement I've never heard of. You know, I don't know how to counsel them about that. I have no data. Does it do something? Does it not do something? Does it have drug interactions? I don't know. Should governments pay? I think we often forget, but in my opinion, the real failure here is one place. It's US FDA. And, and why is it US FDA? US buys 60%, 70% of pharmaceutical revenue globally. The entire industry is built around the US because the market share is so much. So they're all, all of the studies are being done with the intention of pleasing the FDA. In the FDA and oncology drug products, it's literally one person. If you get one person and change their mind, Rick Pazder, you will change the entire global landscape for cancer drugs. But this one person really likes low regulatory bars and is unwitting, unwilling to admit error that Polo is an error. They're not willing to admit it. They're also unwilling to engage with people who have been critical of the agency. They don't have, they don't invite people on FDA panels who are critical of, FD, of the FDA. They only have these, the drug that voting seven versus five, you know, they're picking people who toe the line. So they're not gonna invite people to vote who are critical of the, of the agency. They're the ones who are failing because if they allow Entresto and they allow Paradigm, then we're never gonna get evidence that's, that's sound. They set a low bar and they guarantee the massive US revenue because if you approve it in the US, you have to pay for it. We have our laws that say you have to pay for it. You can't negotiate price until very, very recently where we changed that. I think what we should do is we should decline to pay for drugs based on substantive uncertainty. And then the other thing we could do is eventually the Europeans should come together and say, we're spending 50, 60, 70, hundred billion dollars on drugs. We're going to take 500 million and we're going to run the right study. So you have, you have paradigm. We're just going to run. You take people with heart failure and you randomize them to switch to Entresto or just increase the dose. We'll run that study. It'll cost $10 million. We'll run it at 20 sites. If that's a null study, we're never going to approve your product. We're never going to pay for your product. So I think you need a, some independent group running randomized studies. I don't think we have it in the US. We have mechanisms to try to, I'll tell you, I can tell you why we don't for lots of reasons in the Q&A, but we don't have anybody running those studies. So you can ask a question about real world evidence. We'll talk about that, but nothing is going to say to people more than running a well done randomized study. All right, I'm going to stop here and take questions. Future things to explore. Um, I think many of you have seen this, but I keep a list of every time I see a study that I read and I break down with slides and such, I put it on YouTube and maybe I'll put this on YouTube too. And basically uh, you can get the list here and you can go look through those videos. Um, and if you have any suggestions, you'll see my email at the end. You can email me and say, would you do this trial? And I'll try to do it if I can. I host this podcast plenary session, which some people have listened to, where we break down cancer drug approvals and such. Uh, okay. Oh, I, I meant to put my LinkedIn. I know everyone in Denmark likes LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn too. You can find me. And this is my email if there's any questions. Um, but I'm happy to talk about these issues. But I think the core lesson, I think, is that uh, you can only do so much once the trial is done. It's, and some of these biases are hardwired into the study. And once that's the result, you can't salvage it. I mean, I don't know what the answer is to all those questions. That makes the job of an health technology assessment group very difficult. In fact, sometimes impossible. And the deep solution is to prevent the companies from doing unethical studies. I mean, I think Polo should have been halted by IRB because nobody would want their mother or father to not get any therapy with pancreas cancer. I think that's un unthinkable. But some of these studies, we need parallel studies that are actually done correctly. Um, and I think that's the deep solution. All right, we'll take some questions from the audience. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay, so let's go through the, pl the people involved. Let's go through all of them. The industry. Industry's only incentive is, and, and they literally have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to increase profit. I mean, you, we can't fault them for it. They're the tiger. The tiger is, likes to hunt. I mean, that's the way the system is. So, I mean, asking the industry to not try to game the study, I think, is absolutely futile because they have a regulatory duty to game the study. If the, if the regulator will allow it, they should do it. And I think that I can't ask more from them. They are the tiger. It's our job to put them in the cage. Okay, so I think, so that's one. So the industry, I forgive. Two, the, the doctors. Now, the problem with the doctors, I think, is many problems, but one is, the entire education system to be a doctor is mostly, in many ways, it's about memorization. It's about memorizing biochemistry and physiology. It's about obedience. You're never gonna be a doctor in the US or UK or in any country, unless you know that you have to respect authority. You have to do what your, you know, the, the senior doctor tells you. 
I mean, I trained for, gosh, 14 years to be a doctor in the US, you know? I mean, it's, you cannot go against what people are telling you. So at the end of that process, then you ask somebody to question the system, question Entresto, question these drugs. It's a very difficult. We've psychologically removed, we've screened out all that features from doctors. There are very few doctors who retain their skepticism. They're few and far between. So I think that's one. We also don't train them to appraise evidence. I think many of you all, especially, you know, you do oncology for five, six, seven years, you're going to know more about the evidence for the products than the doctor prescribing. I'm sure you know the trial better, you know the hazard ratios better, you know the endpoints better, you know the primary endpoint better. They don't know it. The next thing I'd say, this is a sad commentary. When my friend who's an oncologist prescribes a new drug, people say, you know, they didn't read the paper, they just read the abstract. I think the truth is even worse than that. They didn't read the abstract. I mean, it's so busy in clinic that you don't have time to read anything. The reason you prescribe the drug is you heard somebody tell you once that it's good and you saw the advertisement. I mean, that's literally the level I think we're prescribing at in the US. I don't know about, I can't speak to other countries, but our days are so busy, people don't have time to read that. They don't have time to read the abstract. They're just going by word of mouth or what some drug company dinner said or what some advertisement says. So that's tough to put a lot on the doctor who's so busy. Um, okay, that's why I think that they're limited and then they're conflicted. I mean, and the KOLs are so conflicted because if you're the company, you know, you want to get prescribing to go up in multiple myeloma, there's 30 people globally you need to get. You get 30 people globally to agree with you, your drug is good, uh, or at least to agree to be quiet, you can get all the prescribing. In, in, in pancreas cancer, maybe 20 people. In, lung, in breast cancer, you maybe need 200 people because there's more in breast cancer, there's more doctors. But there's only so many people you need, and you either need them to be quiet that's set, or praise your product. And they, they give these people so much money. I mean, you have your European databases. We have the US. We know people getting $400,000 per year in drug company payments. You know, these people are detailed. They know who they are. They have a little folder on their desk of them and they go after them. So I think that's why it's hopeless to get the doctors unless you ban all pharmaceutical payments to doctors, which I would support. Actually, I think it should just be banned. It shouldn't be, disclosure is not solution. Absolute total ban is. Um, the patient advocates. Well, I think that's a tough one because one, I think the patients who participate in advocacy societies are not the average patient. It would be better if the government said, here's so much money for patient advocates. We will randomly go through the charts and we'll pick 20 people in Denmark randomly to be the advocates. Random patient with heart failure is the advocate. Instead, we get the person who wants to be the advocate, but that's not the, and the person who wants to be the pancreas cancer advocate is not the person with the average experience. Probably their cancer grows more slowly because people whose tumors are more indolent have more energy to participate in advocacy. I, I do think that that's a problem. And so you're getting somebody, it's an unrepresentative example. When we talk about people who go to the drug regulators and they talk about what it was like for me to take the drug on study, there's a bias. They survived to be present at the meeting. I've often said they should have videotaped diaries on the trial and they should take random videos and play them of somebody who may have died. Let's see what this person who died said about the product and they can tell you what the side effects are really like. Regulators never get to hear from the people who died on the product, killed by the drug, who had side effects that were horrific on the drug. Those stories are lost. We only hear from the person who took it for four years and they feel great. They go to EMA and they say, look at me, I, if it weren't for this drug, I wouldn't be around here. But what about all the hundred people who are dead? Where's their story? We should have videotaped diaries and randomly pull the video. So I think, and then the patient groups are funded by industry. I think that's a problem. The patient groups are mostly funded by industry. The, the few advocates are often funded by industry or they have their own consulting firms or they create their own organizations that creates an indirect conflict of interest. Okay, that's a problem. Now let's go to European HTAs, I think for the most part, pretty good. I mean, you're not allowed to have conflict, you're pretty impartial, but the downside is that career opportunities in the industry are so great. So the industry will just keep taking people from your ranks year after year, which is a big challenge because they can pay double. You know, they can pay double, triple, quadruple, you know, and they're just going to keep taking people from you, which creates a perverse incentive in any organization. At US FDA, we proved in BMJ a few years ago that 60% of them, when they leave, they go to pharma. If I work at FDA and I know 60% of the time I'm going to go to pharma, they pay me four times my salary. Do I really want to say no to polo? Maybe I say, oh, it's okay. Maybe a few years I go work for you. You know, I mean, maybe you're not thinking, maybe they're not thinking it explicitly at FDA, but it is in the back of the mind and it makes people harder to regulate. Okay, now let's go to FDA. The reason I put all the stock on FDA is that um, doctors and patients have difficulty saying no to something that's an option. Once it's an option, we all wanna offer it and have it, and we want, what do you call it, a tool in your toolbox. Everyone wants the tool. 
But somebody has to be the adult and say, this should not be an option because we really don't know. And the only person who can do that is a regulator. Even the payer can't do that because you look like you're depriving people of a proven drug. And in the US, the regulator is not allowed to have conflict with the industry. They're the only person who could do it. Um, but I think they are, they're pretty captured, um, in my opinion. That's why I put a lot of thought with a regulator. But some of them has a copy of my book. But in my book, there's a chapter on the regulator, the payer, the doctor, the patient. There's four chapters on solutions. So we talk about other things. But I am most critical of the regulator. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. How can real world evidence help us? Okay, so one disclosure is I mostly do real world evidence. You know, I don't do randomized studies. So I do like them. You know, don't get me wrong, they're useful. Um, and they have a role, but I think they, they're almost never able to give us the exact thing we want, which is causality, which is the causal effect of the product. So I have a paper a few years ago called Reliable, Cheap, Fast, and Few. What it means is when you generate evidence, you want four things. It has to be reliable. You want the truth. It has to be cheap. Okay, the cheaper, the better. We don't want to spend as more than we need to. It has to be fast, like run very quickly and has to be few, fewest number of people should be put on the ultimately unsuccessful arm, like for ethical reasons, okay. And then in the paper, I actually walk through observational studies and randomized studies, and I prove that actually randomized studies do better on all these metrics. So reliable, there is still discordance between real world evidence, even synthetic control arm, even propensity score matching, even inverse probability weighting, even you know instrumental variable. There's still difference between Observational data and randomized data, significant discordance, maybe one in four discordance, and even in the best data sets, such as this thing called RCT duplicate JAMA paper. The next point about cheap, what you don't fa what factor in is real world evidence, it looks cheap because we don't have to run the study, except you had to give the drug to all these people to collect the evidence on. And I have shown in the paper, that's typically 15 times as many people have to get the drug to collect the evidence to run the real world study. That means you have 15 times the cost of the drug and that drug cost is being paid by the government and that's often more than the cost of running multiple randomized studies even assuming a thirty thousand dollar per person per year fee on randomized study you know so that's the cheap part fast in the paper i show you how long it takes to generate the evidence we think observational study is quick but actually you have to debut a product in 2017 you can only do the observational study in 2023 because the product has to diffuse in the, in the marketplace to really learn. So it can take years, actually. Some examples, it's taken much longer. And actually, many, many more people are exposed to whatever's wrong. If the drug actually works, more people don't get it in the years it runs. And if the drug doesn't work, then more people get it than in a randomized fashion. So I think randomization has a lot of virtues people forget. The problem is that who pays the money is different. In a randomized trial, the government has to pay the money and say, we're going to run the randomized study. In the real world evidence, the health system pays, which in this country is still the government, but in the US it's many, many people paying for this sort of you know, collection of data and, and data curation. And I think, but how can real world data help you? If you find in the clinical study, they took serafinib for nine months, but in, the, in, the, in, in Denmark, the average duration of treatment is two weeks, you know, very different than the trial, then you might say, there's something wrong here. They take nine months in the study, but in the real world, only two months two weeks or something like that. Maybe the drug is more toxic than they think, you know? Or maybe there are other things like clues like that what you could point to drugs that you think, you know, warrant some investigation. Yeah, so I, I generally support that idea that HTAs should be restricted dollar per quality and prioritize things. Whatever you set the cap, we should definitely pay for things, you know, that have lower dollar per quality than things that have less dollar per quality. Uh, I think a cap like that is very reasonable because what gov you know, the U.S. government, we spend 20% of GDP on healthcare. What are you, 9%? Let 10, you're, Switzerland is like 12%. You're like second highest. But I think you are all 9%, 10%. I think that's reasonable, you know, 9%, 10%, and then have some cap. And the cap, what it basically makes sure is you pay for things that have more quality rather than things that have less quality. Sometimes that means, you know, more uh, prenatal care and less oncology. I think that's a rational system. In the US, we don't have the cap. We do have rationing. We just ration based on, you know, socioeconomic status, where you were born, ethnicity, you know, race, we, you know, all the things you're not supposed to ration on, all the sort of cruel discriminatory ways we ration. Um, but we don't ration based on evidence. Now, the only problem I'd say with dollar per quality is what's the dollar per quality of Entresto? What is it? Entresto, the manufacturer, has a paper out. They say it's cost effective. And you can model it. You can have every HTA in Europe or in, in the world model it. You'll all get a different number. 
But the real problem is, does it even work? You know? So that's the challenge, I think. How do you do, co co do, do cost-effectiveness analysis when you don't know effectiveness? I don't know the answer to that question. I think that's the challenge with that. So sometimes a company is penalized for generating very good data. Very good data, you know exactly the dollar per quality. But very uncertain data, then they can argue it's actually better than it is, you know? And so trials that measure overall survival cleanly done might be penalized, ironically. That's one thought. Well, that's a great question. And we were just talking before about some DOAC versus Coumadin studies and in-target INR time, okay, which is another issue, which is another way, you know, you do DOAC versus Coumadin, but Coumadin, you give it a lower in-target INR time than what you really could give it at. And then, of course, DOAC looks very good in all these kinds of games. Um, okay, how do you get better at the skills of reading? I don't know if I know the answer. I guess one thing is we were thinking about making like a 10-part video series called How to Read and Interpret Clinical Trials. Myself, my, somebody I know, Adam Sifu and John Mandrola, you may know. Um, we were going to make a series, so we're working on that. Um, I think the challenge is there's no, there's, no perf there's no one book out there for this topic. So how do people do it? I mean, I'm biased because the two books I wrote, I think we're trying to do that. One is the book she has there, Malignant, about oncology appraisal, but the other one is on ending medical reversal about general medical appraisal. Um, but I think it's a mix of you read the article, you read critical commentary about the article, you read the letters to the editor when they come, and you, and you read that. You read what people write on blogs, you read what people say on Twitter, and then you think about it yourself. Maybe once a month, you pick one art. I mean, you all do this. You pick one topic you really dive into. Um, now, the second part is how do you get other people to... I think about the same thing. I mean, why do I make the podcast and YouTube video uh, and things like that? It's to try to like, you know, you can, some, she can watch my video and, and we've never met until today. And, you know, we're halfway around the globe. And so you can try to do those things. But anytime you find something really interesting, maybe write it up as a paper or write it as a blog post or, and try to disseminate it to other people. Um, or email me if you don't want to do it because I'll post it. Actually, anybody who's doing any HTA work and you find like a trial that you think is problematic and you want people to know about it, but you don't want anyone to know where it came from, <laughs> you can email me and I'll post it, you know? I'll say I said it, you know? Um, but I do think it's important that we have to, we have to keep trying to teach other people um, how to do this. And I feel like each year you feel like you're getting a little better than you were before. At least I feel that way. Hmm. Ah. Wow. And tell me if I'm wrong, the one thing I also heard about these migraine trials, it's not my, I don't focus on it, but one thing I heard is that what we really want to know is if the new costly medicine works for somebody who has exhausted all the available therapies, but what they do is they do studies in people who have like exhausted one of the drugs or people who like just have nuance at migraine and they're not asking the relevant question, which is what about somebody who's tried four things and this is the sixth, fifth, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's terrible to exclude people who, you know, not responding and yeah. I mean, you know, even whatever you think about, uh, like, I think the, one of the challenges with some of these medicines from the psych, from the SSRIs to these medicines is we literally have people taking SSRI for nine years. Do I have any evidence that if you had depression nine years ago, you should keep taking it? It's crazy. The study duration of these SSRI trials is typically 12 weeks. So how do we justify nine years of treatment? I'm shocked that no government has ever run studies in, you take people after who've taken it for two years, three years, four years, five years, randomize them to continue or taper discontinue. I mean, there are studies of continue versus abrupt discontinue, but abrupt discontinue is dangerous, okay? So it should be tapered discontinue. And then measure outcomes one year later. We have none of these studies. We have one study to my knowledge of continuing versus abrupt discontinuation during the journal paper for SSRI. And then for migraine, the, study, the real question is, if you get, have this medicine in your cabinet, three years from now, are you better off than if you didn't have in your cabinet? Uh, how do we know that? We, the studies are just not good enough. And they're very costly drugs. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I think the real question is, is healthcare about health? Or is it really an elaborate financial mechanism to move money from governments to the handful of shareholders of companies? Yeah. And with the way they run the trials, I think it's a financial product. It's not a health product. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I think mm, it depends on the day of the week you ask me, obviously. Like if you catch me on a good day, I tend to be an optimistic person. So I tend to be pretty happy. So I feel like I'm optimistic that, that something will be done in my lifetime just because the pace of, of spending is so high. And every government is, you know, every government is talking about we need to do something. 
at least we acknowledge that the price is going up and up and up and we have to tackle it in some way. But of course, some of you who follow me know that I thought many of the pandemic decisions, especially in the US, make me very pessimistic because I feel like science was thrown away. Evidence was thrown away. No generation of evidence on all these really big questions that affected 100 million, 200 million, 300 million people. The last thing I'd say is in our country right now, you know, if you're a 20 year old man who had three doses of vaccine and you had two COVID, the government says you should get COVID vaccine booster this fall and you can be denied access to school based on this. It's going to be a you know, mandate. OK, your country, I know you put out your guidance 65 and up more sensible, but we're saying 20 year old who had COVID twice has to be boosted or we throw them out of college. That's where we are. OK, how can you look at a country that makes such a decision and be optimistic? I think I'm like, this is really tough <laughs> because, you know, no evidence at all. And so I think that's what gives me a, a pause. I think. When people are worried and scared or when you're talking about cancer or something very serious, you can easily fool people because they're very vulnerable to emotional thinking. When you talk about cancer so bad, pancreas so bad, when you talk about COVID so bad, I mean, it's true. It's a lot of people did suffer, you know, so you can easily get people to be irrational when you talk about you're afraid for yourself, not just, you know, in, 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 like you're afraid it can get people to be irrational. And so I think that's what gives me that's that's what makes me nervous. But hopefully in the long run, rationality prevails. That's what I believe.